Well, good morning. It's good to be back with you. We're in Proverbs uh, chapter 29, and Lord willing, we'll be by the end of our lesson this morning in the 30th chapter of the book of Proverbs, and then then we have uh, only chapter 31 after that, and we will be through. Uh, uh, here is Proverbs 29, beginning in verse 11 this morning, and, uh, and then I'll ask you to set two tabs for a couple of uh, texts that I want to look at. Uh, Proverbs 29, beginning in verse 11. A fool gives full vent to his rage, but the wise finally still it. Now your translations may be a bit different. I will explain why I have chosen this particular word group or word. And if it's different than yours, uh, I have looked at all of them. And I think I understand uh, how these words are put together in the translation. Verse 14 we skip to 14, and I skip because we've either carried uh, this proverb before, and there's no sense in redundancy here, or else I have picked this proverb out for a specific reason, and usually that's because of the difficulty of the proverb itself, and so want to give you as much uh, basic counsel and learning, as I understand, uh, for you to enjoy the proverb. Uh, 14, as for the king who judges the poor through truth, his throne is established forever. And then verse 18, we skip to 18. Without a revelation, the people... Now, here's a different translation. Fall into anarchy. I know that's not your translation. I'll explain it. But as for the one who carefully obeys the teaching, blessed is he. And then we skip to 25. Panic induced by a man lays a snare, but the one who trusts in the Lord will be protected. And then 26, 25 and 26 are really uh, Proverbs that are connected one to the other. 26, many are they that seek the face of a ruler. Now, I know you don't have face, uh, but that is actually the literal translation. It's the face of. And so it is in the presence of, it is before it is, the Hebrew language is very pictorial. And so I just kept it that way. Many are they that seek the face of a ruler, but justice for a person comes from the Lord. And then uh, we'll try to get to a brand new section. Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 1. The sayings of a very wise man, Agur, son of Jacob, an oracle, the inspired utterances of the man Ithiel. So it is uh, a son, and we are the students of the son, but we all, in a way, are uh, the student listening to his wise father and the instruction that he has for him in the 30th chapter. Okay, here is our exposition this morning. Oh, let me give you those two verses um, that I'd like for you to look at. Set a tab. They'll supplement our study. Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah 40 and John chapter 19. Isaiah 40 and John chapter 19. 
Okay, here's our exposition this morning. The fool that gives full vent to his rage or anger. The first mention of an EIQ was back in 1964. It was written about by a doctor, Daniel Goleman, Jewish. No surprise, they are the brilliant of the world. And E stands for emotional, an emotional IQ, a behavioral disposition, an ability that enables one to process, and here is his word, a social environment. I think what he's talking about is just they are able to function in any society, in any place, under any set of rules and circumstances. We see uh, men conform to the military. And the book of Proverbs talks about wisdom as learning to conform, which was interesting to me. I did never think about it that way, but real wise people are people that learn to conform. Had a seminary professor, John Reed, who's now with the Lord, and he said, would always say to us students, life is about transitions and living with them. And so, here is this brilliant Jewish man, Daniel Goleman, and he says that an EIQ is a person that can process a social environment. Now, I think that's interesting because it has been my experience in observing people that very gifted, talented, skilled people uh, have a real emotional deficiency. Uh, when they don't get their way, they throw tantrums, they get enraged, anger. It's like they're dysfunctional. You punch some button and now nothing really works for them. I think we see this often with athletes. We've made them celebrities. And the moment, as I say, you step off the, out of the, the field of play and across the chalk, and you ask them to um, just be one of us, a non-celebrity, just living life, they have a very difficult time doing that, adjusting to that, because they have no equipment for it. You see, all their lives, they've been, they've been told how beautiful they are, how wonderful they are. They've been catered to over this and over that. They are exceptional students, very talented, and it has carried them along. I call it playing on talent. But then the talent wears out, and they can't function in a real-world setting. Uh, you have to know who... Do you know who I am? Don't you know who you're talking to here? Uh, everything has been made special for me. And therefore, you see them have these crack-ups. I think you, we see it often. Uh, they certainly do not understand reality. They're out taking crazy positions on things, and uh, we just wonder, what hemisphere are they in? Well, the reason is they don't have any EIQ. And I think this proverb addresses that. That's why I wanted to look at it and think about it together. Look at this full vent. It literally means to bring forth. It's an interesting verb. And it's used by Isaiah describing the creation. That's why I wanted you to set a tab at Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 26. Uh, here is the verb. I really uh, think it's very neat. Lift up your eyes and see who created these. He who, and here is our verb. This is the verb, full vent. 
It brings out, says Isaiah, brings out their host in number. So the proverb is, in this verb, is the bringing out from the heart. And that's why they give full vent, full expression to what's inside of them. And that creates anger or rage. More about that word in just a moment. I also, uh, I'm going to give you a little lesson within a lesson. Sometimes this happens to me when I come across not only the study of a passage, but looking at a word and it creates all kinds of thoughts and uh, it may be a little bit off the subject, but it's something I've been thinking about and I would like to take just a moment here of our time and think about that word created here. Isaiah 40, verse 26, who created these. Um, I, I've been thinking about this for a long time. Dan got me uh, uh, thinking about this several years back. We were talking about the creation. We were talking about the planets. Uh, we have now sent out probes. Uh, of course, we've, we've been on the moon, but we've now sent probes and landed on Mars. We have got a, some kind of a vehicle or equipment there that takes pictures that roves around Mars. And what do we find? We find it's desolate. It's hot. You can't survive there. You can't survive on the moon. Uh, it is totally antithetical to our environment and life here. <clears throat> Let's think about that for a minute. Um, everything that we would have to take to another planet or moon or whatever, we have to carry with us because it's the only thing that supports life. Now, it says, who created these? Let's think about that creation. What do we see? Well, we see these magnificent stars. Uh, we see these incredible galaxies. And it all started with the Hubble in the early 90s. See, prior to the Hubble, here's what we were told in science. The universe is collapsing. Take 30, 40 billion years. It's all going to collapse. Okay? End of everything. And then we send up the Hubble. And guess what? They're all wrong. They're 180 degrees wrong. It's not collapsing. It's expanding. And it's expanding at a rapid rate. So now we come up with a brand new idea. We never talked about it before, but we start talking about it in the 90s. It's called the Big Bang. And that's what we hear now. Big Bang, Big Bang, Big Bang. We have to have a big bang because everything's expanding. And it had to have a starting point. And so the Hubble teaches us something. The Hubble also takes pictures out there. And we see these big splotches of, uh, of darkness. And so we say, well, look, you know, there's a, that's dark matter. Uh, obviously, that's dark matter. Uh, so there are... Uh, holes out here in the universe. And then we send up the James Webb. And we start getting pictures back from the James Webb this past summer. And guess what? Guess what we found in those dark spots, patches? They're loaded with galaxies far beyond what the the Hubble could possibly see. And now, now their timeline, the astrologers, the scientists, those who educate us, they're, they're all wrong in their timeline. You know why? Because these gigantic galaxies are beyond the smaller ones that are closer. Now, they tell us that it takes three to five billion years 
to make a galaxy, give or take a year, billion, billion there, three to five. Okay, well now explain why the bigger ones are way out there. It's fascinating. And so I'm listening to PBS. Nova, my tax dollars and yours at work, they're educating us. And so the astrologers and the scientists say, well, it's, uh, we're going to find life. We're looking for life. Life out there. Of course you are. Of course you are because you're atheists. You don't believe the Word of God. So what do the planets tell us? They're all uninhabitable. Or they're giant balls of gas and fire. And you're looking for life. Oh yeah, we're going to take... That's why we put an infrared structure to take our pictures so that we can, we can create a, a catalog and be able to say, well, there's hydrogen, there's oxygen, there's the potential for water. They're desperate to find life. Why? Because you see, life then would be our superior. We would be listening to them. We spend all this money and we don't study the Word of God that's right here. I got news for the scientist. I, mean, I got news for all you high IQs. Jesus came here on this planet. He didn't go there, he came here. The Spirit of God hovered over this primordial mass, water, vapor, whatever it was, we're not sure. But it, the Spirit of God came here. Didn't go there. And so the scientist looks at me very smugly and he says, well, you're so arrogant. You believe you're the only one that has life. And you know what my answer is? I'm not arrogant. You know what that is out there? The starry heavens? They, you walk into a room and study the stars and the pictures from the James Webb by walking into a room. Because the pictures take up a whole wall. The scientists are there with their calculators and their computers looking at a giant wall of pictures. But I'm not arrogant. I'm not arrogant at all. You know what I call that? I call it what David called it. Glory. That's what it is. The heavens declare the glory of God. Isaiah said, who created these? And you know what that is? That's ancillary to what's really important for the Lord God. And what's really important? Read the Scriptures. Man is the crown of His creation. He's greater than all of that out there. That infinite amount of stars that radiate to us every day. Man is the crown of the creation. So, a few weeks back, we had Bruce Walkey here, and we were reading the Psalms in the inspired language. We had a guy fly in from Nashville. One came in from uh, Atlanta. Dr. Lilback was here from Philadelphia. And we were reading and contemplating in the inspired language some of these psalms. And Dr. Walkey made this comment. He said, you know, the earth is just a stage in which a great drama is being played out. The drama is good versus evil. And God is going to win it. Well, you know what? I got to thinking about that. It's Job 1. That's exactly right. It's Job 1. So what's the point of the planet? The glory of God. What's the point of man? The drama. Working it out. Which brings us here this morning. We are listening to Him 
through the Scriptures, through the revelation that He gives us, and we are being transformed and made like Him. That is glorious. That's glorious. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You can study the universe until your brain falls out and rolls across the floor. It will not change you. This will change you. The Word will change you. And it will give you a perspective and an understanding that nothing else will. So that's my sermon within a sermon. Here's the last word to the proverb. Anger, rage. We've seen this word many times before. It always is in reference to the wind that blows. So it's one's emotional state. And when we say, man, that person really blew his top. You're being pretty literal about the Hebrew text. That's what it's saying. Look at line two. Skillfully, here is the wise. This final word, finally, literally, in the end, the King James and the New American Standard translate it as a future in the time to come. The idea is the conclusion of a matter. And here is a word for you, stills. That is a good word, and I have a good picture for you of that word. Stills. The wise stills the anger, the bluster of a fool. It's found in Psalm 65 and verse 7. The Proverbs teach us that the wise bring a calm, a peace, a tranquility to a bluster, to an anger, to a rage. And Isaiah 65, 7, it is the calming of a sea. A sea that is enraged and rocking, but it calms. It's peaceful. And that's the ministry of a wise person. He brings order out of chaos. And He brings clarity of thought. That's what you and I are about in the skill for living. Here's 14. As for the king who judges the poor, through truth his throne is established forever. Remember, in the book of Proverbs, always the king is righteous. He's totally righteous. Um, and so, here he is identified, the righteous king for his compassion toward the weak. He represents God's rule upon the earth. Remember, we don't have a democracy when we have a king. The king has absolute, total, complete authority. His voice is law and truth. So everybody's trying to influence the king. Our top line opens with the king's activity. It's judging here. The lexicon has an interesting translation. Vindicating. That's the word. Psalm 43, verse 1. David uses the word. Vindicate me, he says, against an unruly or godless nation. So that's the word. In 1 Samuel 24, 17, after David again, and I say again, spared the life of King Saul, second time, Saul says to David, you are more righteous than I, for you have... And our translation reads reward. It's actually the word vindication. You have vindicated me with good, and I have vindicated you with evil. We change the nuance a little bit in English to make it much more clear to our understanding 
and we substitute the, uh, the word reward. It's the idea of the outcome of something. The words of Saul in that moment, I mean, I, you think about David. I, I would almost, I would almost tear her up emotionally the moment he said that. Get the context. This is a man who has been chased and tried to be killed, who has had a wicked king do everything in his power to destroy him, to destroy his life. And at this moment, he says, you have rewarded me with good, I have rewarded you with evil. That's a complete vindication of David and of his entire life. You said it, O king. O king, what you speak is law and order and truth and righteousness. You said it, Saul, not David. Let another praise you, said the Proverbs, not your own lips. The Proverbs say, through truth. You see, He, the righteous King, delivers the powerless and the oppressed and the poor. I I thought this was an interesting comment from Derek Kidner, the Cambridge scholar. The full test of a man in power, he writes, is one who keeps faith with those who can put the least amount of pressure on him man in power who takes care of the poor and the weak and vindicates them. That's what the king was called to do. Line 2. And for that, the consequence, his throne will be established forever. Established, we know that word. Studying in Proverbs, set, fixed, put in place. Psalm 11 and verse 2. It is the arrow attached to the string. It's Set, established, fixed. And then the final word, forever, perpetuity, translated in Psalm 111 and verse 3 as that way, forever. Glorious and majestic are the deeds and His righteousness endures forever. Now, who is the ideal king? Well, he's the Lord Jesus Christ. And... There are no ideal kings in reality. But Christ is, and He will come and rule His kingdom, and He will establish His justice in the earth, and it will occur according to the prophets overnight. Overnight. Can you imagine? Can you imagine what that means? Right is right, wrong is wrong, and it's going to happen, and it's going to happen instantly because He is going to rule from His throne. And I believe that that is right out of Jerusalem in the world. He will take the seat of David. Fabulous idea, and it's a tremendous blessing to consider it. Here is 18. Without revelation, the people fall into anarchy. This often quoted top line, this phrase, lack of vision, it's difficult to define or explain if you really study it out in the Scriptures. We we come up with some kind of mystical ideas with that. Uh, We use the word vision as some kind of a, uh, an ability to, to actually see and understand something that no one else can. So, in understanding the proverb, what I want to do is go through and understand these words and phrases very carefully so that we can really deduce what the proverb is saying. We open the top line without revelation. As I have said before, I hope you hear it just as a tape recording running through your mind. We presuppose, that's our starting point, 
It is our starting point because nothing precedes it. it. We presuppose that without the revelation of God speaking, we don't know anything. So we can, we can study the stars, but if we don't go to God's Word, they have no interpretive value to us whatsoever. They're just part of the creation. So it's one of our presuppositions of theology. That if God doesn't speak, you and I don't know anything. Not a thing. When it comes to the reality of good and evil, right and wrong, the skill or non-skill for living. And in order to possess that wisdom that we're looking for, one must read and absorb the revelation that He has given. And that's not having a quiet walk in the park. That's getting the Word of God into our minds. That's how we're going to see things and understand our reality, and it's going to change us. This opening, without, is best described probably by 1 Samuel 3.1. In those days, the Word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. And so the common people, they didn't have the Word of God. We didn't go to, you didn't go to the bookstore in the ancient world and buy you know, buy, buy a copy of the Old Testament. Nobody had that. It was all oral. It was passed down. Who had the Scriptures were the priests, and to the extent that the prophets had them in their hands, they had them. The common people didn't. The revelation of God primarily came from priests and prophets. That was John the Baptist's father, remember? He was a priest. And he was entered the Holy of Holies. And there he saw a vision and God spoke to him. Now, what about today? What about today? Well, there are no prophets. No prophets. Not today. Man tells you he's a prophet. He's a fool. Not a prophet. There are priests. We're sitting in a room of priests. We're all priests, according to the New Testament. We're believer priests. We are the ones who appeal directly to the high priest, and we need no other mediary between God and man. We go directly to the Lord Himself. So we're all priests, and we don't need prophets. So what's the answer to our dilemma with the, the average man. Well, we go to the Scriptures. That's what they're there for. Proverbs 11.14 helps to clarify this top line. Proverbs 11.14, where there's no guidance, the people fall. What is guidance? It's a reference to wisdom, to truth, to righteousness, to equity. Here's how we're supposed to live. And here it is. It's in guidance. Job chapter 29, verses 21 and 22. Men, he said, would listen to me. And after I finished speaking, they were quiet. Why? He is wise. He had wisdom. He had the skill for living. And he was the final word on a matter or a subject. That's what he told us. This word revelation has had, as you can imagine, much discussion. It's trans, been translated vision or authority or prophecy. Uh, most of the scholarly material treat this as the Lord speaking through an individual. Now, people say, well, I had a word of prophecy. I'm not going to dispute that. Why, who am I to dispute that you had a word of prophecy? But here's my counsel. Keep your prophecy to yourself. Don't go putting it on me. You know, like I had a 500-foot-tall Jesus at the end of my bed 
telling me to tell you to send me money. No. You keep your vision, your prophecies to yourself. They're not for me. They're for you. I'm not going to dispute whether you have them or not. And I'm not going to enter into some debate with you whether you're a prophet or not. I know what I believe. I don't believe in the authority of people. I believe in the authority of the Word of God. I get my translations and my applications from them. I think you would be wise to do the same. Often in the Proverbs, we have a parallel to uh, prophecy, authority, uh, to this word instruction. Okay, what's the word instruction? Well, here it is. Torah. The Old Testament law. That's your authority. It's the Scriptures. They didn't have the New Testament. This is Paul's Bible. This is what Paul used. It's the Scriptures. Now, our final words now. This is different than what you're used to. What you're used to reading. Fall into anarchy. Your translation reads something like cast off restraint. Here is the lexicon in regards to this verb. It says it's used to let go or to let loose on a restraint. Okay? So, what's an example of that? How about Judges 17.6? In those days, there was no king, so you didn't have a final ruler, right? You have no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. That's falling into anarchy. There's no guide. There's no leadership. There's nothing of of authority to point to, to set our lives like a plumb line to walk straight. No, there was nothing like that. People just, what they do? They just behave naturally, which is self-destruction. You behave naturally. You're going to destroy yourself. And we see it every day. And that's exactly what the top line here is asserting. Without a revelation, people act naturally. But I want to remind you. I want to remind myself. I do it all the time. My life is the supernatural life. I don't blend in. Jesus does not want us to blend in. Let your light Shine before others that you bring glory and honor to your Savior. So you don't act like everybody else acts. You're different. And that's why He brought you into this world by faith. So that you could, in this generation, at this time, a time such as this, bring honor and glory to Him by being different. And when that attracts people, they say, why are you so different? Does that happen to you? Happens to me. Line two. Look, the careful obedience, now that, what is that? That's a, well, that's the covenant loyalty that we have toward our Savior that we try to practice. We fall, we fail, but we, moment by moment, put it back into practice. Here's the way the Apostle Paul put it. 2 Corinthians 5.9 We make it our goal to please Him. Blessed is the man and the woman that does that. I came away recently reading that, and I thought to myself, you know, you just don't put enough into your Christian life. That's what I said to myself. I need to have a fanatical effort. That's what I need to do. I need to have a fanatical effort to righteousness, into service, into 
into daily fellowship with Him. If I do that, the Scriptures tell me I'll be blessed. I'll have happiness. I'll have peace. I'll have joy. And they come to the person who truly follows the Word of God. Well, we've run out of time. My Isaiah sermon within a sermon took too much of our time. We'll, Lord willing, be back together next week and we'll try to climb into the 30th chapter of the book of Proverbs. Let's pray. Thank You, Father, for this opportunity once again to be together before the Scriptures. They are the light. They are the truth. They are our authority. And apart from them, we know nothing. We are not all wise. We are empty vessels. Fill us with Your knowledge. And by Your Spirit, we will walk with You and bring You honor and glory. That is the goal of everything. The chief end of man is to love You, serve You, and bring You honor in all ways. Bless us to that end. Thank You for this opportunity. Be with our friend Mark and with his family today with a, an extra amount of grace upon grace to endure this difficulty, this providence you have thrown him in. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.